What's going on guys? I'm Tyler, and to complete my series of 2021 TIFF reviews, finally, I'm here to let you know that Inuo is no perfect movie. And Inuo takes place in feudal Japan revolving around a blind musician named Tomona who comes across an aspiring dancer known as Inuo who has several deformities such as an extended arm and a deformed face that he keeps hidden with a wooden mask. In order to lift the curse that has bestowed those deformities on him to begin with, the two of them put on a series of song and dance performances that I'll get into later that inspire so many people in their village, but also piss off the local shogun because of the details in some of their lyrics. And the main reason I wanted to check this movie out was that it comes to us from Masaki Yuasa, the director of Mind Game, Night is Short, Walk On Girl, and Ride Your Wave, movies that... I've been told have a reputation of being imaginative acid trips where they're, where the worlds that he creates have their own certain set of rules, and that was more than enough for me to get excited, but when I looked into the plot details that surprisingly held a lot back, I found out that this was kind of a musical anime. And ask any devoted anime fan, I don't think they could even name that many musical anime to begin with, so I figured... Even if it sucks, I can safely say that I've seen nothing like this before and it'll be one hell of an experience, which, um... Fucking hell, this was one insane experience. Inuo is an anime rock opera where these Queen-style concerts taking place in feudal Japan happen with no one questioning it, and I had an absolute blast watching this movie. The concert sequences were fucking awesome, and to anyone who's looking at me going, how the hell can this even happen? Why shouldn't we question this? I'm going to explain the environment and atmosphere of these concerts without spoiling as much as possible, because if I give certain details as to what is the wow effect into these moments, I'm going to completely ruin it for you guys. But in any case, the one instrument that Timona plays throughout the entire movie, this one lute that kind of has the shape and strings of a guitar actually sounds like an electric guitar in this movie every single time he plays it. There are bodyguards and ushers to keep the crowds from losing their mind or getting up on the stage, but they're all dressed like common soldiers of the era, similar to how Timona has this Marilyn Manson-esque type of look with the longer hair, the darker clothes, the darker colors and designs on his kimono, and the fact that instead of mascara on his face, it's the makeup from a prostitute. There are pyrotechnic effects, not electronically. They got a fire breather standing next to him as he's playing guitar. And I'm not kidding when I say this. There is a fucking Jumbotron. And I'm not going to dare give a slight hint as to how that worked. Because when I found out how it worked, my jaw was on the floor. It was so fucking clever. The displays that they put on the Jumbotron and Inuo's reactions towards it as he's singing and dancing along to it was so... It was so damn imaginative. And the music itself was really well done, too. In regards to replicating the concert atmosphere for the animation and the editing, they know precisely when to show the performers on stage executing their moves, demonstrating their stage persona, and then cut to the crowd losing their mind, cheering, waving their hands, singing and dancing along with them. It really makes you feel, as you're sitting in the theater, that you are at the concert with the extras, even though those extras literally aren't even there. And in regards to the songs themselves, they're basically... Each and every one of them is a retelling of a battle from a certain war that happened a few hundred years ago, but Inuo and Timona are telling it from the perspective of the losing side, because the losing side spirits are the ones cursing Inuo in the first place. The lyrics in the English translation anyways do kind of sound kind of dull on paper, and it makes me wonder what's going to happen when G-Kids actually does record a dub for this movie, and... I'm still going to be there to check it out, just out of plain curiosity, but it really comes down to the composer of this movie, whose name I'm going to put down here, because I can't, I can't say it right, you all know that already, and honestly, he deserves credit where it's, due, where it's due. The composition and the instrumental performances were absolutely awesome. They were fast-paced, energetic, fantastic rhythm guitar, 
The singing has this unfiltered, raw, and angry line delivery. Everything that you would expect from a punk hard rock song. One thing that I was definitely expecting from this movie when I heard that Inuo was an inspired dancer was to see some incredibly elaborate dance choreography, and that is exactly what I got. It was fast-paced, it was fluid, the animation was so up to par with live action given the fact that the insanely acrobatic choreography where Inuo with his extended arm can do so many can do so many contortions and so many backflips, and Yuasa shows it all in single takes which is something you don't get in live action when it comes to dance work, let alone in animation. And just from a drawing standpoint, Yuasa creates a movie that feels wholly original just based on the most minor of cinematic techniques that I wish movies in general would use a lot more often. There's one case where he often tells scenes from the perspective of a certain character in POV shots, kind of like in Wolf Walkers where through certain colored lines and echolocations, you can see what a wolf smells, hears, and sounds. When a scene is told from the perspective of Timona in some cases, we do get a kind of sort of POV of the objects and people that are in his line of sight, but they're all portrayed in these blurry brush strokes that I honestly don't think I've ever seen before in most paintings, let alone in a movie. And... When we get a POV shot of Inuo, we can only see through the holes in his wooden mask that um, make you question where his eyes and mouth are on his face given the exact position, but it creates a lot of mystery surrounding who he is underneath all of the clothing and all of the wooden masks. And it's such a... It's such a fascinating thing to talk about, because usually in animation the movie would rely on a lot of exaggerated facial expressions to explain what a character is going through or for the sake of entertainment value. Here, we have two main characters whose eyes are often hidden for the sake of dramatic effect. With Timona's case, his his eyes will either be shrouded in shadows or covered by his hair and his hat. And with Inuo, it is the ever-changing wooden masks that show how much more outgoing he becomes as a person as his curse becomes more and more lifted over time. But his rebellious persona that he had at the beginning of the movie is still there based on the designs and his attitude as he's wearing them, which which reminds me, the voice acting and the characterization for this movie is pretty good too. I like the fact that even before the two of them meet, Inuo and Timona are in positions where even amongst groups of outsiders, which they are a part of, there's a certain set of rules and guidelines they've been told to abide by that causes them to rebel. In Timona's case, he was already on the path to becoming a blind musician once he had been orphaned, and something that I didn't actually... something I never found out before until now was that it was pretty common back in this era for blind people to become Buddhist monks who perform with these lutes as they're performing, as they're reciting their own scriptures. And it's interesting that, as I said before, like, even amongst outsiders, there's a certain set of rules that if you don't follow, you become the outcast that the outcasts reject, which is a huge blow to self-esteem anyways. But the rules that they have to abide by sound so ridiculous even back then, let alone now. I mean... Never mind the fact that Timona is told to play only one form of music, in this case, religious scripture, when he has passion towards just about anything else. Never mind the fact that even though these monks are all blind, they get offended when he grows out his hair. I mean, really. And Inuo has faced so much stigmatization from his family, let alone a society that barely knows him, based on incredibly obvious reasons that, as opposed to being desperate to find friends, at the beginning of the movie, he actually likes to scare the shit out of people with his presence and get off on their terrifi- on them being terrified. It isn't until he meets Timona that he realizes the dude is blind and he's taken aback and just sits there and goes, Huh. Well, now what are we gonna do? But at the same time, he's also flattered that he finally gets to meet someone who isn't who hasn't already formed their opinion based on him over his appearance, and they can actually judge him based on his positive traits. But what drives the emotional stakes in the movie is that even though they find a ton of success reaching people who love their music, love their performance ability, the fact that they've actually gained respect they've never had before through genuine bravery and talent, there's still a great deal of suspense from the people who don't understand them or are seriously convinced that their music is a threat to society that 
there's this constant fear of censorship, whether it be disownment from your clans, whether it be imprisonment, among other things, that reminded me of the Parent Music Resource Group or the Washington Wise, whatever those, whatever that group was that I discovered a little while ago. If you haven't heard of them, back in the 1980s, the Washington Wives, led by Tipper Gore, yes, that Gore, wanted to regulate the music industry based on the fact that 80s rock in particular was kind of considered devil music through the music video imagery and their interpretation of the lyrics in particular. And you know those explicit uh, labels that you see on music records? It's called the Tipper Sticker in her honor. And needless to say, when certain music records and certain music artists completely said, we're not going along with this, you can fuck off, they of course went to their husbands, oh, sorry, I mean uh, Congress, to threaten legislature that, um, to threaten legislation that would clearly go against the First Amendment. Seriously, Congress shall pass no law. And they all were completely oblivious to that fact. But in any case, they asked a few mus musicians to come to Congress to testify in their defense, supposedly out of fairness, but they figured John Denver would be on their side because he was the wholesome folk musician. They thought Frank Zappa would be a weirdo because, honestly, he kind of was. And they thought Dee Snyder would just be, well, your basic punk. And it turned out all three of them spoke with equal amounts of intelligence and criticism and outspokenness Equally, if not more so than the politicians, John Denver was on everybody else's side because even though he was a wholesome guy, his songs had been censored because the lyrics had been misinterpreted as pro-drug use. Frank Zappa flat out said... What, what did he say? Oh yeah, he, he spoke with a great amount of intellect that no one had ever heard of him before. And Dee Snyder revealed that Under the Blade was about the fear of surgery, the fear of complications, the fear of death. And he revealed that he is, in fact, a, teeto a teetotaling Christian, which, teetotalers love rock. Uh, that's awesome, D. And this was, like, 1985. The video I discovered about it said this is was 1985, not 1885. It was such a huge change of pace for Tiff to showcase a movie about the importance of freedom of, of expression. The fact that free speech means free speech against people who you disagree with, people who objectively say things that aren't true. The dangerous aspects of censorship, especially since the previous example I just mentioned, you could point at anything and interpret it as being dangerous enough to silence. The fact that silencing people does not instantly erase the trouble that they have created. Assuming they've created anything at all, it doesn't instantly make you right. Which is high and mighty, considering Tiff doesn't believe in any of those ideals, if I'm being completely honest. 90% of the movies they show every year have the opinions that they already agree with and push for in every fucking commercial that they show before the screening. And don't get me wrong, I agree with most of those beliefs, but... It comes to a point where you see a movie being inserted into TIFF from Dallas Sonier, one of, if not the biggest conservative film producers, who makes a ton of great films like Sparrow Creek or any S. Craig Zoller film, and they get shoved into Midnight Madness and treated with less respect than other Midnight Madness movies, which is insane, because honestly, those ones are my favorite because of how apolitical they are, because... They're not concerned with pushing a message. They just want to entertain us. And the interesting thing, Tiff folks, if you're watching this, I go to Tiff for movies that help me escape. Not to be reminded of shit that I already agree with. Not to be talked down to like I'm a fucking moron. And I'm talking to you, Mr. Anderson, in those Government Canada commercials. You should probably talk to Spike Lee, Antoine Fuqua, John Singleton, Justin Lin, among other filmmakers that you conveniently left out, you dumb motherfucker. But in any case, the one problem that I actually had with Inuo was that for the first 15 to 20 minutes or so, 
it's a completely different tone and completely different story from the rest of the movie. It revolves more around the backstory surrounding how Timona became blind and orphaned and the path that he made becoming a musician. And it wasn't necessarily bad. It just keeps you waiting from the stuff that you want to see later on. It doesn't really have anything to do with the rest of the movie in regards to the actual plot. And I felt that more time could have been spent on the evolving relationship between Inuo and Timona, since you don't get that many scenes of them just hanging out and discovering what it is they have in common, other than the fact that they're just outsiders with a love for music. But in any case, Inuo in one second were easily the best movies I saw at TIFF this year. This movie has such a sense of wild imagination through through the music the animation the themes the acting i say this to all my friends this is basically an anime version of a knight's tale in the best possible way and even if that sounds stupid i would highly recommend checking it out just for the hell of it so for all those reasons i'm gonna give inuo a 4.5 out of 5 no idea when it comes out in 2022 but in any case definitely check it out when you get the chance Guys, thanks as always for watching. If you have seen Inuo, let me know in the comments below what you thought of it. Be sure to stay tuned for more reviews, and be sure to like and subscribe. Take care.